I hope you've uh, been able to um, go and uh, get yourselves a refreshment or, or a, a bite to eat and leave a donation for the wonderful people who have uh, put tonight's event on. We are talking about the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network and Voices of Warringah. Thank you. So, uh, let's begin with an acknowledgement of country with Catherine Donaldson. Donnelly, I beg your pardon, there we go, straight away, I've made a, bl I have a blooper. And uh, Matt on Didge, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. It's with great privilege and honour that I actually give an acknowledgement tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the Garrigal people and the Gurungai people whose land this always has been and who have been custodians of the space in which we meet tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the ancestors and pay my deepest respects to all Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders that are here with us tonight as well. And I'd like to acknowledge the future and emerging leaders that will lead us into regenerative and sustainable ways from these wisdoms that have always been known through the most ancient culture on earth. We are very privileged to be living here and we ask that you open your hearts to listen to this conversation because the power is in your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, we have um, um, a lot to get through tonight, and I'm going to ask our wonderful candidates to go in the lucky dip for it in a moment to see who gets to speak first. Um, and I know that a lot of you have been out uh, today door knocking, wearing out the shoe leather and are glad for the sit down as well. We have our fabulous moderator who has a bell. Bing. <laughs> well, she did have a bell. She, <laughs> she did have a bell. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, I know, we'll get to that. I'm just wondering, all I wanted you to do was to ding and you stuffed it up. We're not off to a don't, don't try with the big one, please. Oh, Lord, Lord. Okay. To uh, look, to kick us, don't be standing and taking my profile picture while I'm trying to speak. I will have to. Have, no, no, bad angle. Sit down. 
Go on, I'll run a tight ship round here. Sit down. <laughs> I would like to ask to kick us off tonight uh, to say a few words. Uh, Catherine, Catherine Ridge, who is uh, going to talk a little bit about the voices of Warringah and what they've been up to. So if we can ask you to say a few words, Catherine. It's not Catherine tonight. <laughs> okay, so I've got a moderator who's an idiot. I've got someone who's written my notes who's failed me twice. Nigel, I shall soldier on. It's all my fault. It is. I beg your pardon. Who are you? Uh, Alex. My name's Alexander from Voices of Ringo. Excellent. Go right, go Thank right. you. <laughs> okay. So Voices of Aringa began in 2018, round table talks uh, and the community coming together to get involved in democracy. Voices of Aringa at tonight's event is just about the community having their say uh, on what's important to them and the best outcomes for the community. So we'd like to thank uh, everybody for coming and getting involved. Uh, we really look forward to hearing your questions and likewise uh, hearing from our candidates. Um, and I'd also like to thank Nigel from the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network who's co-hosting tonight's event. Thank you. Don't, don't thank Nigel. His notes are terrible. <laughs> All right, let's get to our candidates. Please choose a number out of the hat because we are going to ask you to kick off proceedings with three minutes each. After we have done that, we are going to go out into the audience and we are going to field for questions and there will be people walking around with mics to help you do that. So, to give me uh, your, your numbers, who have we got up first? It is you. All righty. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you're ready with your questions. Well, I know we have a few written down. I don't know whether I don't have them with me, but... We have one microphone between all of you for the obvious reason <laughs> that you can't then jump in and uh, annoy each other because we are going to do that to you tonight rather than you do it to each other. Oh, we have some written questions here. Terrific. Good. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask each of our candidates to get up and say a few words, give you the pitch, the elevator pitch in three minutes. And the woman with the bell. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> what? No tugboat? I mean, the noise of it. Good Lord. All right, okay. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome our first speaker, Jackie, Jackie Scrooby. Are we staying seated or getting up? Whichever you like. Okay, we'll just... Who is at, running as an independent here in Pittwater. <laughs> oh! Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you for tonight to the organisers, to Wendy, um, and for the acknowledgement of country as well. So, um, my name's Jackie Scrooby. Uh, I, I'm a mum of two. Um, I live up in Whale Beach, and most recently, I was policy advisor to our federal member, Dr Sophie Scomps, uh, in Canberra for the last six months, and prior to that, I was her campaign manager. Um, I actually started my career as an environmental lawyer working at DLA Piper, which was then Phillips Fox. Um, I also had a secondment at the Environment Defender's Office and then moved into management consultancy, um, advising ASX 200 companies and also state and federal government, uh, primarily on climate risk and decarbonisation. Uh, I was with them twice, that, that group was called Energetics, a boutique consultancy firm, and in between when I had my two children, I actually um, started a small business as well. And I'm looking at Matt, whose wife was my business partner, they now own Avalon Whole Foods. Um, so I've had that small business experience as well, which has been invaluable. Uh, the reason I'm running for the seat of Pittwater is because I feel my values very much reflect the values of the people of Pittwater. Um, I'm running on a platform of climate, integrity, economy, and these are issues that definitely resonated with our electorate and with the electorate of McKellar uh, in the federal election. And what I've come to realise, which I suppose I knew before, but um, when I was 
uh, put in the position where I was considering running for this seat was that so much gets implemented at a state level when it comes to these important things. So when it comes to climate, you know, our electorate in particular, we're facing the PEP 11 licence rearing its head again. And I'm ready to take action on that, which we can talk about tonight. Um, but obviously, New South Wales approves coal and gas approvals as well for, all, for mining. Um, that's a major issue when it comes to climate, as is uh, native forest and any native forest logging as well, um, as well as a range of other things in terms of implementation of you know, good energy policy for households you know, to reduce energy bills, uh, transport and so forth. In terms of um, economy, I think it's critical we're all facing this cost of living crisis. Um, what's of particular concern to the people of Pittwater is rising um, mortgage costs as well. And I think we need sensible economic management both to ensure that the measures we take don't add to inflation and, of course, mortgage costs, um, but also... Um, but also uh, there's opportunities in following Queensland's lead in regards to some economic policy as well. Integrity, it's a state issue. It's also a local issue when it comes to the Beaches Link Tunnel and our hospital. And finally, I just wanted to say what an incredible opportunity it is for this seat to... It's looking increasingly likely that we will have um, a minority government situation. And similar to the current New South Wales government, where independents such as Alex Greenwich and Greg Piper have, um, have a seat at the table. I'm really excited for the opportunity for Pittwater to have a seat at that table to steer New South Wales and its policy direction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, a lot of uh, support for Jackie tonight. You're up next, Rory. Thank Rory you. Amon, who is a standing for the Liberals in the seat of Pittwater. Thanks, Rory. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, and, and thank you, Jackie, for your comments, and, and also to Jeff and Hillary, because I, I, all of us on this platform know that what everyone here is doing is not an easy thing, and so I think um, congratulations to all of you for putting your hand up, because this is a, it's a really difficult thing to do. I'd also like to thank, yeah, so, I mean, feel, feel free to give a round of applause to, to the candidates as well. I think it's also a wonderful thing to, to see Catherine with her, her welcome to country at the beginning. Um, there are not many things that New Zealand do better than us, but I think the way in which they appreciate their um, Indigenous communities are far ahead of how we do here, and so I think what we saw tonight was a great step forward. But, look, my name is Rory Amon, and I'm the Liberal candidate for Pittwater. I'm a lifelong Northern Beaches local, and this has been my home all my life. I've been a, a Northern Beaches council for the past five and a half years, and I've also been a volunteer firefighter for the past 10. In my day job, I work as a family lawyer. And the reason I'm standing is, is very similar to Jackie, which is I love this community and I want to make sure that we make it the best it can be. And I think um, it's a privilege to be able to put my hand up to follow in the good footsteps of Rob Stokes, who's delivered so widely for our community, be it the Beeline uh, bus service, be it the Kia Ride service, uh, be it the duplication of Bonneville Road East or the $53 million upgrade to Bonneville Public School. There is still a lot to do, and that includes duplication of Bonneville Road West. It includes the Wakehurst Parkway. It includes upgrading North Narrabeen Primary School and Narrabeen Sports High, and these are things we need to get to. But ultimately what this election is going to come down to is after 25 March, we're going to have a Liberal or a Labor government. And the risk we run is last time we had Labor government, we saw more development in D1 in Warrywood. We saw no new infrastructure. We saw Beacon Hill High School closed. And we saw Seaforth TAFE closed. The Liberal government has delivered extraordinarily for this area over the past 12 years. Chris Mintz has also promised to tear up the Northern Beaches housing targets. Currently, from Palm Beach to Manly, we have a housing target of 275 over the next 10 years. That'll be ripped up under a Labor government, and we will see development and density across the entirety of the Northern Beaches. And so the choice we need to make is do we want to have a government that has delivered for Pittwater over the past 12 years or do we want to have a government which will put Pittwater at risk in terms of all those other things we've spoken about, density, development and all those things. Thank you. Good on you, Rory. Thank you. And up third, we have Geoffrey Quinn who is standing for Labor. Hi. the time start now? Time start now. All right. I've had a wonderful day today. I, was, I worked from nine o'clock with 
four or five students and then uh, did an assessment with another student and then taught uh, maths and English to four others and finished about 3.30. And then I came here and got to meet all these wonderful people. So I'm not a career politician, I never have been, I never had aspired to be one. But I've lived here all my life and I've seen what's happened to this beautiful area and I don't want it to ever continue the way it is. Now, we can have scare tactics about what Labor's going to do, but as your, your local MLA, I'd be fighting for Pittwater. And Pittwater is not, it's more than just a place where I've lived, it's a place where my ancestors have lived since the 1800, middle 1800s. We grew up in Narrabeen, we saw people come in to this area and change it irreparably. But we have a chance now to build a harmonious and beautiful environment where humans can live, where we keep our trees, we keep our beautiful uh, wildlife corridors, we make sure that the roads work and don't kill animals when they're trying to cross it, and we keep things like Oh, lucky it wasn't a heart attack, hey! <laughs> Where would we end up? What would happen? Hey, what would happen? We'd be dead on the road. And that's what used to happen to my ancestors, the people that we knew. When Mike Parr was living in Narrabeen, there was 12 families. People used to die from ticks. But we lost a hospital. Why? Because the bloody clinician said we didn't need it. Who are they? Who are they? Right? Now, I'm not angry, I'm livid. The same as what is happening with the roads, the bus service. Imagine if they sold Mona Vale Hospital to a private, uh, sold uh, Mona Vale Public School to a private group. Imagine if they demolished that and moved it up to bloody French's Forest. How dare they? Now, you can sit there and be really staid and wander off into your delusional areas of, oh, let's vote for an independent so they can sit in the corner and, oh, we can say things. Well, what can they say? Well, they can't govern. We're the government. The Labor Party will win. We will win fabulously. And if, and if I'm your member, I'll stick up for you in that party. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And I would please ask our next speaker not to fake a <laughs> fatal illness. Because it was, you just had me going there for a bit. Oh, Lord. Sit down. Hillary Green is standing for the Greens. Thanks, Hillary. Yes, I'm your Greens candidate. <laughs> I'm your, yes, I'm Hillary Green and I'm your Greens candidate in this crucial election where we must vote for change. I too acknowledge that we live on the land of the Garrigal people and I pay my respects to all their elders and thank them for looking after these precious places for tens of thousands of years. So me. I didn't like school much, so I worked hard so that I could get out and have a good time. I got a scholarship, lucky I to go to university, luckily, because I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. I, I was privileged to be able to leave home and pay a very low rent living with friends while I studied. Sort of. Um, <laughs> I taught in a variety of schools, including in Papua New Guinea, and always paid very affordable rent. I forgot to say, when I was a student, I paid $7 a week in rent, in, in, a house, in student housing. So I was able to save and travel widely, and a secure job meant I was able to put a deposit on a unit and later in a house on the northern beaches. 
I became a single mother and Medicare helped us with all our medical expenses. A government program enabled me to retrain for a new career, which I did, and I paid for all my postgraduate degrees, a couple of them, all of them, and, um, and I, which were very affordable, so I had no hex. The university funded my PhD. My, my daughter enjoyed a public school education and excelled at university. She has a happy little family, two gorgeous kids, and she still has a hex debt. Um, we are both forever grateful to the paramedics and amazing nursing staff at Monavale Hospital for their services, and in particular for the time when they saved her life. You can see I have been so fortunate in the opportunities in education, in health, in secure in employment and in housing affordability. The Greens are advocating a change to enable everyone to have a fair go and live amidst a healthy, thriving, natural environment. Please vote one Green in the upper house and in the lower house. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, just a quick, um, uh, I should probably give you my quick biographical note. Um, I have been living in uh, Collaroy for 30 years now. My two kids went to Pittwater High, just up the road. And, uh, and I am actually in Wakehurst. Um, but I'm two streets away from Pittwater. So that's how I come to have a, you know, a fairly good working knowledge of what is happening in this part of the world. We have got lots of topics to tackle tonight, haven't we? Um, we have, oh gosh, we, uh, hospitals were mentioned there for our... We have an ambulance on standby, I hear. Um, <laughs> We have got Lizard Rock, we have got development, we've got the Wakehurst Parkway, we have sea walls, we have uh, the Harbour Tunnel, we have lots to talk about. So we're going to be getting your questions in just one moment. But I thought I might ask a question of all of you, um, just to kick things off. Um, what have you, and this is one that has come up a couple of times, what do you think that you've delivered for pit water uh, specifically through your community work? Well, I mean, let me put it this way. What do you think the major issues are in pit water? And we'll just go down the row, if we can hand the, uh, the microphone down the row. Where have we got the microphone there? No, I just got it. No, no, I'm not going off script. This is a question that is actually a written question and um, one that's asked for a lot. Tell us about the community work that you've been doing and what uh, you have been able to achieve, you think, and uh, what you see as the big issues are. Pretty smartly, too, if you would. I don't do a lot in, of community work for free. Uh, I've a member of the Labor Party and I do a lot of work for helping the Labor Party get its word out. My job takes seven days a week generally. I tutor kids who've got disabilities, who have trouble with reading. I help dyslexic kids learn how to read. I help parents feel less anxious about their kids' future. And it's, I do it all on my own and it takes seven days a week to keep things going. Mm -hmm. I own, uh, I have one business at French's Forest that I've had for 26 years and I've got one at Monavale that I've been running for 20 years. Uh, so I'm not really a community person, I'm not a fireman or anything like that. Yep. I look after my family and I uh, you know, just help kids and help their parents. All right, well good, I thank you very much for that. And just handing down again, we'll just go one more along, we'll just go along the road, Jackie. 
What do, what have you been doing with your I'm not gonna uh, get as up a community I have heels person? On. Other people don't. Um, so what have I been doing in terms of the community? I suppose, and what have I delivered? Well, I delivered Sophie Sconce as our federal member, <laughs> working. In, but. Um, but community work, particularly in this community in the last few years, has been obviously involved in listening to the community through um, McKellar Rising, also through Sophie's campaign and continuing to do that. Um, through COVID as well, I delivered, I have an online course, Six Weeks to Plastic Free, which is about zero waste living, which I delivered to the community remotely because Northern Beaches Council had um, you know, shifted to online. Um, and then also I'm usually found, um, you know, doing sausages down at Avalon Nippers. Um, in terms of my community work throughout my life, I, you know, similar to Jeff, I've worked um, in industries where I've been able to align my values, also with delivering what I feel is addressing climate change in, um, in various ways, and that's been through an individual basis and also through um, you know, advising companies as well, which isn't community work, but I think similar to Jeff, I've tried to align my career um, with what I feel is um, a duty for us all to take action in that area. All right, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so well, while I was at university, I made sure that the data we analysed in class was often aligned to climate change issues in particular. Since retiring, I have been a volunteer in um, Mona Vale Public School mostly, um, helping children with reading, and I'm now an ethics teacher in Mona Vale Public School. <laughs> and I, um, I'm a knitting nana, very proudly a knitting nana. <laughs> and I did all the data analysis and presentation for Sophie Scomps. In, no, for Voices of McKellar. Voices of McKellar, I'm so okay. sorry. Thank you for that. And, um, well, I'm now trying to make sure the people of Pigwater understand that green is good. All right, thank you. And you, Rory, we know you had you uh, been on council, of course, but what have you, else have you been doing along thank the you. way? Thank you, and um, thank you for the very flattering photo that you've got there of me in my mullet, in my mullet COVID era, uh, which is now well and truly gone. So um, this is me, that's me there, just in case there's any confusion. Um, Wendy, look, that's a really good question, and um, on Northern Beaches Council, I've really been proud to represent um, our community there for the last five and a half years. Some highlights for me have included um, securing $2.3 million of council money to buy land on Hillside Road up in Newport to incorporate that into the Tunga Reserve on Newport Hill. Um, something else was securing $2.5 million to fast track the rebuild of the Monovale Surf Club. In Pittwater as a councillor, one of the things that people always say to me is, we need new footpaths. And so in that time, since amalgamation, new footpath spending has increased 80% in the Pittwater LGA area, which is something I'm pretty proud of because that's something our community really want. In terms of personally, I've been a volunteer firefighter for the past 10 years, and that takes up a lot of my summer time. Um, fortunately, we haven't been impacted by devastating bushfires here, uh, but we will in the future, it, it will come. And so that's something, a, a contribution I'm pretty proud of, as well as being a president of my Davidson Brigade for many years. Good on you, Rory, thank you. Now, we uh, throw it over to you to ask questions, and this is your chance to um, direct a question to a particular candidate. Most of the written questions I have here are to all candidates, so I might ask a, a few of them a little later. As I say, you can, um, direct, you can direct a question to a candidate or, you know, direct it to all of them and they'll answer in turn if that's what you'd like. And I would ask you just to do identify yourself, if you will, just your name and uh, where you're from. And uh, the woman with the bell, she's on it. You can tell that she's on it. So we just want you to keep your answers succinct. And I would just also ask, we are looking for questions. We're not looking for um, stump speeches from the audience, if you don't mind. I'll be pretty strict about that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Wendy, and thank you, panel. Um, my question is directed to... Jackie Scrooby. Can you just tell us who you are and where Jonathan you are? Jonathan King. Yep. 
local resident for 40 years. Okay. Many times candidate for the environmental okay. issues. Okay. Um, my question is directed to Jackie Scrooby mm -hmm. and our ALP candidate mm -hmm. claimed that independents just sit in the corner. And my question, my question to Jackie Scrooby is, could you please explain the impact that independents can have in parliament, apart from just sitting in the corner? Thank you. I was going to bring that up, that I don't agree with Jeff, that I don't think independents um, sit in the corner. Um, obviously, I've had my experience in Canberra in the last six months, seeing the role that independents play both in the upper house, where there is a balance of power, um, and also in the lower house, where there's not a balance of power. Despite not having balance of power, um, I've personally been involved in assisting Dr. Sophie Scomps in amending multiple... To, to what you think will happen on the state level. Oh, okay, so the state role, I actually think it's looking more and more probable that there is going to be a minority government. We have an existing minority government. And so what we can look to what the independents have achieved in this um, parliament. So yes, we will have stable government, but we will be able to achieve making good policy better amending legislation, pushing both sides, well, whoever's in government to go further with their legislation, and also creating new laws. So we've seen Alex Greenwich and Greg Piper um, deliver laws in areas that the major parties haven't touched, from decriminalising abortion to increasing um, follow the money legislation to ensure that if, say, Transurban is given money, the auditor can follow where that money is spent and used. So independents, on, um, particularly in a minority government, deliver laws, they make good policy better. And um, dare I say it, um, with the PEP 11 permit um, on the horizon, I worked with existing members of New South Wales government to draft legislation to stop PEP 11 um, by preventing approval of its infrastructure. Um, we heard from the Liberal government um, that it wasn't a New South Wales issue, there's nothing that could be done. In fact, nothing had been done by the Liberals for 12 years. And within 12 days of me announcing that legislation, um, we had the Liberal government stand up saying that they were going to pass similar legislation. I'm not even elected yet, and if that's what is able to be delivered through having independence in this democratic race and having a seat at the table, then that's incredibly powerful and I think Pittwater having the opportunity to have an independent um, is something that is, you know, the ball's in everyone's court here. It's an incredible opportunity and one I'm taking seriously and look forward okay. to delivering on. Thank both, you for that. Both for Pittwater and also for the state. Thank you. <laughs> Nigel. Nigel, we, Nigel. Nigel, l leave the microphone up here because we have another one down there. It just save you going back and forth. Rory, could you grab that for us, please? Cheers. Yes, we have a question here. Oh, hello. Um, yes, uh, my name's Sean O'Shaughnessy. I've come to Pitwater uh, from northeast New South Wales, where I've been in the forests, uh, our native forests, which are currently being smashed by this government. And, uh, you know, their greenwashing aside, uh, our, our, our forests are in rapid decline. I mean, we know that native forest logging will actually uh, make it possible for us to reach our climate targets. If we want to make effective action on climate change, we have to protect our native Yes, you forests. have a question? I do. If we continue logging our koalas, they will be extinct by 2050. So I'm asking all of you, uh, if you are elected to represent Pitwater, will you commit to a rapid end to the logging of our public native forests? All right, Rory, we'll start with you. Sean, uh, thank, you. thank you for that question. Um, over the past recent years, the New South Wales Liberal Government has acquired one million hectares of, of um, forests and incorporated it into our national and state parks. And I think we can all agree that's a good thing. In the recent budget, the, the state government has committed $190 million to a koala strategy. That's creating various areas where koalas can, can uh, regenerate, where they can thrive and where they can be invested in. There is 3,157 uh, 3, hectares of land dedicated to koala regeneration. What do you think about the de proposed development in Little Bay, Rory? The proposed development in Little Bay? Little Bay. Look, Wendy, I've, I've been out in the community for the past four weeks. Um, no, one's, no one's raised that particular All development right, with me. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to take that It's just an notice. impact on koala habitat. I think a few people might be uh, acquainted with. 
Um, okay. Uh, uh, and, yep. Hand, hand on. Okay. Well, um, the Greens policy is just to stop native forest logging. All of it. Stop it. It's, it's, um, it's a state-subsidised industry that runs at a loss. There are only 1,000, about 1,000 employed people in that industry and they could be easily transitioned to a much more beneficial industry. Um, in the last three years, 40% of the koala population has, has gone. It's gone. They, they've gone. We need to get them back. It's not only the koalas that have gone, it's all the other biodiversity that mm -hmm. we don't see and is vital for our environment. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. And um, it is incredibly important we end native forest logging uh, for biodiversity. Obviously, koalas on the path to extinction by 2050 in New South Wales. That needs to end. They don't need money. They need habitat. And they need uh, native forests. Um, it's an industry that's subsidised, which I find incredible that we're subsidising an industry where native forests are logged primarily for low-value products to go overseas to China, like wood chips and so forth. Um, and there's a lack of transparency in the industry as well, to a point where you can't actually find proper data. There's no Senki diagram as to showing where all, all, all that product goes. Um, but most importantly, as Hillary mentioned, our biodiversity, we've had scathing reports at a federal and state level on our biodiversity crisis, on the koala crisis. We need to end native forest logging, claw back the $12 million a year we spend on it. And, um, and that's something that obviously that I would be negotiating on should I be in a position to negotiate um, in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Uh, one other thing, it's, there's precedent for it. So Victoria and WA have committed to end native forest logging. Um, and it's not just the native forest logging, but also, I suppose, land clearing as well on um, private land, which has increased 13-fold under this current government. So, Okay, thank you. This is a hard one for me because the Labor Party policy is not to stop native forests but to scale it back over a period of time to allow the people who work in that industry to move on to other, other areas. But it's not going to happen in a really short time. Things that we will do is expand national parks like the new one that was announced today to protect the koala habitat in, down in the Appen Way. And, the, and between those two uh, areas so that we've got a national park that will keep those koalas well done. But there's other things that we need to do and that is to, to look at the whole areas of like the Pilliga and the, in, the influx of fracking. And one of the things that I forgot to say was that I was one of the founding members of No CSG Northern Beaches and we were really involved in fighting that area uh, when they wanted to frack St Peter's okay. but going back to native forests there's a balance that can be where we look at forests as our native forests are they fully uh, protected because they're set there are they regrowth or are they native forests that have uh, been virgin forests for all that time I think the push now in the party is to look at uh, logging regrowth forests rather than native forests. Mm -hmm. But it will happen eventually. Okay, you would be captured by the union movement on that, wouldn't you, the Labor Party? Oh, I don't know, Wendy. I'm not that, that much into it. But I think that there'd be jobs at stake and, and people... You've got to, uh, to protect those people who believe that they're doing the right thing. Oh. And if we look after those people as well, we can, we can help the whole system okay. rather than just destroy it. Thank you. Can we have a question about a local issue here in Pittwater? Hi, my name is Tom. Wait. I'm from Alcorn. I want to ask each one of you, not only will you end native forest logging in New South Wales, but would you support either local or state laws designed to protect the soils, geology, flora and fauna of this area, which has been absolutely fucking decimated since we have had Pippa Water Council abolish and this Liberal National Government destroy koalas from okay. South West Sydney. All right, well, th thanks. I, uh, I got the gist of your question there and I think that's a quite a broad one, but we'll try and find a microphone for you. It's, well, well, it is a very broad question because you've just said enact 
laws and I would rather something more specific. Um, yes, a question. Uh, can we go to a local, a local issue? My name's Sandra Tremino and I li I've lived on the northern beaches for 59 years. Um, my question is to Jackie Scrooby and to Hilary Green. If you're an elected to a hung parliament, would you support the Labor Party to form government? Um, thanks for your question. So this is an easy one for me to answer. I've been incredibly clear both on my website but in press about what I would take to the table should there be a minority government, which it is looking pro probable, and how I would choose to form government would be based on those negotiations. So the things that I would be negotiating on, um, primarily under the climate, you know, the climate front would be PEP 11. As I mentioned, I have legislation ready to go, so whichever um, party would be willing to pass that legislation. Um, obviously, native forest logging as well. Um, in, terms of in, uh, in terms of integrity, uh, the, both the gambling policy um, of both parties is insufficient to deliver the outcomes that they, um, that they seek to deliver. So that's ending crime through poker machines, primarily money laundering, and secondly, through um, minimising gambling harm. Both policies of Labor and Liberal are insufficient in this area, and I've been quite clear about how I would push um, both parties to go further. Again, that would be something that I would negotiate on. Um, so, in answer to your question, I am issues focused. I don't have any party alignment or ideologies, and um, I would be negotiating for the best outcomes on those two major issues. And then, of course, pit water. So, in a lot of ways, um, you know. Rob Stokes has delivered in some areas, and in other areas um, he hasn't. The fact we've got Wakehurst Parkway that continues to flood every time it rains. Um, we've got schools... Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Jackie. We'll, just we'll leave negotiate that one there. on pit water yeah. issues as well. Thank you. And uh, let's oh, hear Hillary. from Hillary. Who would you support in the event of a hung parliament? Well, I, I hope that we do have a hung parliament because then I, we, we will be able to negotiate with either side about very important issues, issues like public education, public transport, um, fair wages, and, uh, well, health, health issues, nurse to patient ratios, um, paying teachers fairly and supporting them. That is, um, a, that is, a, very big, uh, that is a very big shopping list to take yes, but um, in whoever, the event of who you would support in the, uh, well, I suspect, in the case of a hung parliament. I suspect that the Labor government would be more on my side with okay, most of those that's issues. That's the question. That's the answer we were looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question down here. Can we get the microphone there? Thank you. My question is about a decision Oh, sorry, Sylvia Sastrak, Avalon Beach. Yep. My question is about a decision that the State Parliament will be making in July, in July this year. Thank yep. you. Um, there is currently a trial in Western Sydney, several trials, of um, e-scooters. And you may have noticed that there are more and more e-bikes around at the moment. E-scooters are currently illegal, though I saw one on the Corso this morning at Manly. And my question is, when you have to vote in July whether to make this kind of motorised transport legal among uh, people who are pedestrians like me, when they can do a maximum speed of 100. No, we don't need to go. We know what these scooters okay, are. You know Thank you very are, much. Right? Well, my yes, question we have, is... Yes, we have the question. Are you my directing question it is, to... Are my you, question is to each one of you, right. would you vote for them to be legal on our um, okay, got it. pedestrian uh, ways? And also, would you push for them to be separate so that pedestrians can All feel right. safe? Okay, thank you. Uh, Rory, you can kick that Sylvia, one off. Sylvia, thank, e thank you for your question. And I think we've corresponded on various matters uh, on council um, account from time to time, so thank you for coming tonight. Look, I would wait to see the outcome of the trial. I'd wait to see what the recommendations were arising from the trial, what the experts say, what the lived experience is in Western Sydney. Um, there's no bill I'm aware of quite yet. Um, so until I see the outcomes of the trial, I can't really provide further comment other than to say that I would look at the outcomes of the trial, consult with the Pitwater community, and then make a decision from there. Okay. Um, yes, I suppose similar. However, I was nearly run over by one the other day. 
<laughs> and um, <laughs> um, the person wasn't wearing a helmet. He came belting around a corner no, with no bell or anything. Huh? And no, he said it wasn't. <laughs> Anyhow, so I think there are laws, that, uh, there are laws and they need to be followed up that uh, make it safer for this, we can't stop the transport, it needs to go somewhere and while there are no so cycleways, um, sometimes they'll have to go to the footpath. So they need to be very clear that we need to be very clear that they're there and safe. Maybe there needs, obviously there'll need to be a, a a, t a speed limit on the footpaths. Um, okay, but so in short, you'll wait for the trial as well. Thank you. Pass the microphone along. Thanks. Um, thank you for your question. I almost feel my father-in-law could have written this exact question. <laughs> and I'm quite nervous to answer because I'll be speaking to him soon. Look, the, the answer is I, I, I don't know enough to say how I would vote right now. Um, what I would say is that um, we do need to envisage how our cities will be over you know, 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years. And active transport, I believe, does play a role in that. Um, but you mentioned concerns, pedestrian safety, lack of insurance. There's a range of concerns. Um, Rory uh, I, I, I'm just going to stop you Rory there, actually, Jackie, because of your opening remark, the way it was, you haven't really given it a lot of thought. So let's just pass that oh, on. Can I just say one thing, Wendy? We, very quickly. Which is, I would give an answer actually similar to Rory's, that I'd look at the evidence All right. and consult. Okay. And actually, I think Rory would have to vote with his party rather than having an independent opinion on that vote. All I right. can't imagine that would be a okay. conscious vote for him. Thank you for for that, and what about you, Geoffrey? <laughs> Have you had uh, e-scooters on your mind? I, I, I can't stop thinking about them. <laughs> but they can be dangerous. Is, it, is that the way you're going to get to the hospital? <laughs> well, if it's flooded, well, I might have to get a canoe. <laughs> The thing about being in a party is that it would be debated within the caucus and, and then on the, the body of evidence from the, the uh, inquest or whatever, the, the, tre the, the tests of what it's done, the, the coroner's reports on all the dead people from it, <laughs> then, then we'd make a decision as a party and then that's how we'd vote. Yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Party. Thank you. Um, we have a we have a we have a question just there in that row. Thank you. Just keep. Well, I, I should tell you that we will be going through till twenty past eight with questions, so we've got plenty of time. I've got a few up my sleeve here as well. Hi, uh, my name is Felicity. Uh, I ran for the Greens three times, mm -hmm. and I was with Rob Stokes, and I ended up with twenty five percent, which was pretty good. Anyway. <laughs> I just wanted to ask each one of you a hypothetical question that if you were the planning minister, as Rob Stokes was, would you follow in his footsteps and approve new coal mines and fracking of gas in the Pilliga? Okay, thank you. No! <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. No, I don't. One of the policy platforms I have is not approving any more new coal and gas. We need to transition away. We have enough as it is, and we need to focus on transition. Sorry. Um, and I met with um, farmers from the Liverpool Plains the other day. Uh, they are incredibly worried about the impact to New South Wales and Australia's food bowl from fracking. And I will do anything I can to stop that um, extension of that project going ahead and stop Santos from um, fracking in, in the Liverpool Plains. Thank you for that. So, similarly, my answer is absolutely not. Good out. Thank you, Felicity, for that question. And I think you're also knitting, Nana, because I recall seeing you uh, outside one of the offices one time. 
Oh, you got the chief knitting nana. There you go. Look, um, Felicity, the, the World Wildlife Fund has ranked New South Wales as the number one jurisdiction in the country in the race to become renewable uh, energy superpower. And what that factors in is a whole range of policy settings across the board. And so New South Wales is leading the way with a net zero target by 2050 and a 70 per cent target by 2035. And you support new, new, new coal and, what and that, gas fields, Rory. And, and what That's that, what we're what asking. That, what, that, what that target factors in is that target factors in everything that's going on in New South Wales. And so every single project is subject to an independent planning process and it has to go through that process. And New South Wales, and, and, and Felicity, Felicity, don't, don't ask me, ask the World Wildlife Fund, which has said New South Wales is the number one jurisdiction when it comes to renewable energy. All right, all right, people, settle, settle, settle if you would, thank you. All right, we have a question up the back. I'm Georgia Beretic. I'm living in this area for 30 years, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm uh, asking every single one of you candidates that in your opinion, since you are all local, you tell me what are three the most important um, problems that uh, you would uh, tackle first term. Okay. The three most important issues you tackle in your first term. Rory. Now, G Georgia, are you asking locally or at a state level? Locally. That's a really good question. So I think um, the number one issue You're that You're not going to say if anyone asks you a really bad question, are you, Rory? Thank you. <laughs> They're all good questions, yeah, Wendy. Oh, They're sure. all good yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. only bad thing in this room is that photo of me, which is yeah, yeah, side-eyeing yeah, 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 me yeah, yeah. on an ongoing basis. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, do Georgia, look like you've smelt something rather. I, I don't know. I oh, don't know yes. what's going on, but I tell you what, there's something <laughs> not right there. Uh, there are pro probably a lot of offended hairdressers um, yeah. across Pitwater. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Georgia, top, top three issues in Pitwater. Top three issues. Cost of, cost of living is number one. That is the number one issue that people are telling me when I'm out about in the community. The New South Wales government has a number of cost of living measures which are targeted to individuals, be they families with children, be they people who need help with energy bills. Uh, the next issue is uh, making sure we get the infrastructure we need in this area. The last 12 years we've seen significant infrastructure into pit water as I referenced earlier. And that's going to continue under a Liberal government, be it Monovale Road West as a perfect example of $340 million committed. And the third thing is, is ensuring that we keep this place beautiful. The housing target, which I referred to earlier, is going to ensure that we have a sustainable area in terms of the number of houses going up in this community. And that's something we need to ensure remains in place. A Liberal government is committed to that. I can't say the same of a possible Labor government. Okay. Top three issues, as you, uh, as, as, well, I should say, what is, as you see them or, and as you hear on the ground, no doubt. Thanks. Right. So, um, firstly, um, the re-establishment of public emergency and acute services at our Monavelle Hospital. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were truly bulldozed when the coalition government ignored our fervent demands and forced its public-private partnership hospital on us. A privately owned industry, a personal uh, enterprise, which pays no tax because it's based in the Cayman Islands, which leases the land on which it operates for one dollar per year, and its bottom line is its profit, not our health. That's number one. Number two is education. It must be fairly funded. Public education is massively underfunded. Our teachers are underpaid and not supported. We need to change that. Mm -hmm. And number three, of, of course, is the Greens DNA, who we are is protecting our environment and tackling climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of three local issues, the first would be fighting over development. So obviously preserving our conservation zones, which are currently at risk under the LEP. There's a number of ways that that could be achieved, um, which I can go into later this evening. 
Um, and also linked to overdevelopment and something that I am different with Rory on because I think we're all trying to fight overdevelopment here, but um, Beaches Link Tunnel. So there's been a scathing New South Wales inquiry into the Beaches Link Tunnel. Uh, it asked before the New South Wales uh, election that the business case be released. Uh, that was due for release this Monday and, um, you know, I'd like to call on Rory to say whether his government would release that business case um, even though they're in caretaker mode. My concern there is uh, what Perite said last year, which was uh, housing density will increase on the northern beaches as a result of that tunnel. That seriously concerns me. Um, I also dispute the 275 number, but we can chat about that later. Um, so overdevelopment, fight overdevelopment. Uh, in terms of the hospital, uh, implement the New South Wales inquiry recommendations into the hospital and demand more transparency, some of the issues Hillary mentioned. Uh, and also um, keeping Wakehurst Parkway open and schools. So that's four. Thank you. <laughs> Jeffrey? Uh, the first thing I'd do is make sure that they didn't do anything with Baron Joey Lighthouse and that we stopped any commercialisation of the national parks. Second thing would be to start really heavily lobbying the Health Minister to rebuild Marnavale Hospital. Yeah. Uh, I've been on the, re on the Save Marnavale Hospital Committee for ages as the Labor Rep, but uh, now we've changed the name to Rebuild and there's some stickers over there that uh, you might like to take and uh, put them on your car and start thinking about generating that. The next thing is I grew up in this area and it was Ringa. Shire Council and we had Pitwater Council cleave off and it was a really useful thing to see the place looking good and everything like we had really close democracy with mm -hmm. lots of people represented where people had a control of an LEP and I think that's one of the major things that I'd really start working on is getting a plebiscite so that we could make a decision I know it's not a big issue with the younger people and with everyone else, perhaps who's thinking, oh yeah, we're all right, we've got Northern Beaches Council, uh, they're looking after us. But I don't think they, I think they could be doing a lot better, and, but I think we need to have a chance to vote so that we can decide. Mm -hmm. I was disenfranchised by that move to make Northern Beaches Council. I want us to have a choice. Okay. And that choice would, meet, would be contingent upon our LEPs and our DCPs being strengthened so that we can stop overpopulation. All right. Over well, I just well, on that note, let me just, um, let me just get a one word um, or very quick answer from all of you, just to hand the microphone along. Are you in favour of de-amalgamation? Not I am. you out there, them. <laughs> Let's, uh, just pass the microphone along if you would, Geoffrey. Personally, I am. You are? Yep. Um, I think there are a couple of options to address some of the things we've spoken about. One is de-amalgamation. In principle, yes, communities should have the right to, um, to have evidence on the table and make informed decisions, like at a pleb site. Um, but I feel, I know myself, I don't have enough empirical data and information to be able to assess whether we should be um, de-amalgamating or not. What I do know, it's one option, as is looking at our current um, LEP and looking at the opportunities in mm -hmm. front of us to stop loss of okay. conservation it's zones. It's a very, very expensive exercise, of course. Exactly. So I think it's a balanced approach and there are many ways, to, I don't want to skin cats, okay. but okay. there are many ways yep. to approach this issue and that is one of them. All right. We'll just hand along there. We're just looking for a quick answer. Yes. Okay. Rory. Thank you. Well, Jeff, I, I hope that on my time on council I've been able to enfranchise you as much as possible. But look, w one of the things that I do is, um, as a councillor, I hear from a lot of community groups and a lot of residents. When I first got onto council, the community groups up here wanted to demalcomate. Over time, that position has changed. So the PBWBA, CAPRA, um, the Avalon Preservation Association, various Monaval groups, Church Point groups, none of them tell me now they want to demalgamate. And so if, if we want to demalgamation, I encourage you, please join those groups. Get, in, get involved in those groups. Have those groups form positions that they can take to councillors and elected representatives that we can advocate for on your behalf. And that's what I'll always do. Can I just get a show of hands here tonight who would be in favour of de-amalgamating? 
Okay, okay, that looks like a majority there. Those against? Yeah, it looks like we've, get, we've just got a little bit of a majority there in favour of dim amalgamation. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to ask a question, and it is about seawalls, Rory. You may have noticed that I'm a, an activist in this particular area. Yes, 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 and your lesser half as well. Yes. Yes. So, uh, are you in favour of more seawalls, the extension of the seawall on Collaroy and Narrabeen? That's a little bit of a... I guess it, it does encroach into, into this um, electorate a little. But more than that, what is your position on the Newport seawall, which you will know was rejected by the Independent Planning Panel, and now your council is appealing that decision? Thank you, Wendy. When it comes to seawalls, um, I look at the evidence and I look at the science and I look at what the experts tell us. Well, you um, didn't... Well, anyway, as a I won't go there, but anyway. Well, if you let me finish my answer, yeah, yeah, Wendy, yeah, right I'd, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, as a, as a councillor, I look at the evidence, I scrutinise the evidence, I ask questions of council officers, I ask questions of, of, of the experts as well. And what the experts have said, not only at a council level but at a state level as well, the depart state departments, they have given the seawalls a tick of approval. When it comes to the Newport Surf Club, I support the proposed redevelopment up at Newport. I think that is a critical piece of um, infrastructure for the community and the surf club community up there. Mm -hmm. And I support it because the council experts are comfortable with what's proposed. Excuse me, but it was knocked back by a panel of and, experts. And, when, and Wendy, it's going through a process. And so in that process, uh, councillors applied for a review and, and it'll work through that process and the process will have an mm -hmm. outcome, whatever it may be. Okay. Well, this is a little bit out of my depth. That's all right. We'll pass the microphone on. No, then. no, no. But I would just like to say, why is the seawall necessary, and who's paying for it? Is it necessary to protect private housing or public infrastructure, and um, who's paying for it? So I would need to know the answers to those questions okay, first. Thank you. Um, look, this is an issue I was studying at law school about 20 years ago and it shouldn't be left to local councils, I don't think, to make these decisions regarding coastal erosion, climate, climate adaptation issues. We need to bring this up to a state level. We need a coastal commissioner, um, exactly what Rory said, looking at the evidence and um, making an informed decision and taking a state approach to issues that Hillary mentioned as well, who bears the cost and so forth. In regards to Newport, I haven't been down there. I'm generally um, opposed to sea walls given what's happened in Collaroy. Having said that, I need to go and consult and see the plans for Newport. I also support surf life-saving clubs. There's a whole range of issues. I'm, I'd need to take that on notice mm -hmm. in particular. And again, I would say the answer that Rory gave might be fine as a councillor um, and voting as a councillor, but when it gets to state level, um, again, this will be, you know, the Liberal Party's position, not Rory's position, um, and as an as a independent, I can vote for the community and based on evidence-based policy every single time. Thank you. And Jeffrey. Wendy, I beg an indulgence to tell a bit of a history story. No. <laughs> we've got, we've only got about 10 minutes okay. left, Jeffrey, and I know some so other folks want to ask walls questions. Are unproductive for a journal system. If you've been down and seen the one at Collaroy, it's just outrageously bad. Um, quickly, if we fix Narrabeen Lake Mouth and get the channel working again instead of having it clogged up, the whole infrastructure or the whole longshore drift system will change. At the moment, the Narrabeen Lagoon goes like this. We need to remove the causeway that was put there 120 years ago or 115 years ago and make it so that our Narrabeen Lagoon fl flushes out and the sand goes out and deposits at the back. When I was a kid, you could take off on a three-foot wave behind the point now you've got your surfing inside the point. And it's because of the structure of the sand dune mm -hmm. and it has been completely changed and the longshore drift doesn't back up and hold the sand bank anymore. So it comes in and scours. And that'll be made worse by sea walls. Okay. Well, on. thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we have a question over uh, down here. Hello, Wendy. I'm Rachel. Hello, Rachel. What an entertaining night, I have to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
You're welcome. Um, we haven't broken into song yet. That could be <laughs> happening any moment. Um, I'm part of the Northern Beaches Bushland Guardians to Save Lizard Rock, and we have our launch next week. I'm passionate about saving the bushland. However, I'm a renter, and I would like to ask each candidate if they are renters and, and how they are going to fix the housing affordability crisis with social and, um, so, and housing affordability for teachers and the everyday worker. So okay. what are you going to do about it? Yep. Yes, because I, I should say that, I mean, this is a really interesting issue here, isn't it? Because you know the rest of, uh, the rest of Sydney just regards us as a shocking bunch of NIMBYs who, you know, don't want any development in our area. And I hear you all say we don't want any development. But as Rachel said, there is a real problem with affordable housing. And uh, so it is something that we really have to address as a community where that balance is. So what Rachel would like to know is what you think, uh, are you a renter? And what you think about increasing the availability of housing? Uh, I own my own home. So I can't really talk, but I used to rent. But I lived in Narrabeen when $10 a week was the rental for a house. And we used to have a place across the road from my grandmother's and it was, you know, she used to pay 15 bucks a week and we paid, uh, we ended up, we, we got a rent increase to 20 a week. So that's sort of a yeah, different Yeah, rent was two bob as well, yeah, wasn't but, it? You know, so, know. like, we're going back, you it's know, not like really mustics and all yeah, that, you know. Yeah, yeah, mustics, she could buy. Ten of them for a penny. The, the plans that we have to do, this area, we can't just say, oh, we'll put affordable housing because affordable housing is different for all of us. So what we need to do is look at where can we build... And, uh, well, you know that the, what makes a house affordable or not is actually a fixed ratio to your income. Well, exactly. That's, that's what I meant. Like, it's affordable for you to live at, in uh, Coleroy, and it's for, at the moment it's affordable for me to live at Church Point. But for someone who's struggling, where do you live? Like, it, when I started teaching, the teachers lived here and travelled to Mount Druitt for mm -hmm. work, and now they live out west to travel here. So we've got to look at how, the, the planning, uh, from a planning point of view, we have to look at how we develop this area but we can do it sensibly without overdeveloping it. And there's architectural plans that we've seen when we've sat here and listened to the architects who talked about uh, the zoning changes of how we can develop areas that are multi-dwelling but without ruining the structure of pit water and the beauty. So we have to look at our scenic ability to... Uh, we want to keep our scenic uh, trees and wildlife corridors, but we can develop habitats for everyone to live, but we have to change the way we look at property. And that's a long-term long idea that needs a philosophical change of mind. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks for your question. Um, so I am a renter, so I get it. And also I've um, got friends who have, you know, uh, ended marriages found it really hard to afford to rent up here, even in apartments. Um, it is a vexed issue because we have beautiful natural environment, and I'm, you know, absolutely committed to keeping the, you know, the character of the peninsula as houses nestled in trees and fight overdevelopment. Um, however, Northern Beaches Council has done a housing strategy which um, can meet the housing targets, um, which Rory said. 275 new homes, it's 12,000 new homes that are needed with a 275 shortfall. The Northern Beaches housing strategy is within the existing urban footprint without needing to cut down trees such as Lizard Rock. Um, but 100% we need to do more around supporting essential services in regards to affordable housing because up at Barrenjoey High School we've got a teacher shortage. Um, you know, there are issues with nurses not being able to live near where they work. So developments such as Brookvale um, and other developments earmarked in the Northern Beaches housing strategy need to have those targets for essential worker housing and we need to make sure there is an option um, on the Northern Beaches, not necessarily in Pittwater, but on the Northern well, Beaches. Well, isn't that interesting housing. that you say that, uh, 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 Jackie, because you've just said something, as I say, that you know, the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the city says about this place. You say we can have more housing, but it shouldn't be in Pittwater, it should be in Wakehurst. Um, I didn't say Wakehurst. I said I support the, it is, it is, I support the Northern Beaches housing strategy and I also, something that I haven't spoken about tonight is 
this planning and long-term vision for our area and bringing community back into planning. There are innovative ways, whether it be duplexes, granny flats, there are ways that we can incorporate more affordable housing on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually support a method such as deliberative democracy, getting the community involved and being involved okay. in our future vision because it is a vexed issue and we have competing priorities. All right, well, thank you for that. Yes, well, um, the, mor the mortgage rate, the interest rate has gone up a few percent. Well, I'm not quite sure. I'm sorry, I do own my own house. Um, the interest rates have gone up, wages have basically gone backwards, but rents have practically doubled. People can't afford these rents. So one of the Greens policies is to put a cap on rentals. Another one is to make sure that all new housing built in this area is for affordable housing. Um, and, and we don't need to build houses on conservation zones. Natural process over the next few years, by the time when it will be necessary, we'll, you'll find more granny flats, more double storeys being built. You're it will you're happen. You're talking about increasing density rather than... Yes, I am in, in, yep. okay. in, in urban areas, All right. not Good. urban sprawl. Okay. And Rory, your um, thoughts? Thank you, Hilary and Jackie and Jeff. Rachel, that's a, a very good... That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, Rachel... Um, Please don't have to say something back to Jackie. Wendy, in 2017, the Northern Beaches Council released the policy affordable housing, and in that time they've done absolutely nothing to implement it. I just want to say that. All right, okay, well Rory's on, was on that council. Thank you, so. thank you Rachel. Look, I, I own a two bedroom apartment in Narrabeen, and, and I'm very lucky and very fortunate. Um, one of the things that I've done on council is advocate for a 15% affordable housing target in the French Forest Town Centre, which I know will help. It's not going to solve all the problems. Um, one of the difficulties you have is when you increase the percentage of affordable housing, as many of the councillors in this room will know, in order to make the development viable to actually build, you've got to go up. And so you've got to strike that balance. The thing that the state government is doing to assist on affordable housing is saying to first home buyers, you can opt between paying stamp duty or an annualised fee. Now that helps them get into the market. Once you get in, it becomes that much easier to progress. There's no, there's no silver bullet. But I think there's a good small steps that government can take in our time. So would you, would you um, advocate um, some um, high-rise maybe in this area? Um, not in Pittwater, no. What about in Wakehurst? <laughs> um, you know, where the hoi polloi live. Well, Wendy, Brook, Brook, Brookvale's actually down in Manly, so that's even a further electorate away. Yeah, right, so I okay. think we can... All yeah. right, OK. Uh, we have one last... I think... Well, look at this. I'm sorry we're running out of time. We have a question down here, but I think this has got to be the last, unfortunately, folks. I'm sure that the candidates will be happy to be buttonholed after the... After, that's their job. So you can uh, speak with them personally. Yes, sir. Thank you, Wendy. I'm Graham Jessup from a Sustainable Northern Beaches Group. Uh, earlier, uh, the issue of the Northern Beaches Tunnel was mentioned. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know from each of the uh, panel do they support uh, the proposed Northern Beaches Tunnel? Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. No. Based on the current proposal, no. No, we don't. No, all right, well, that was pretty quick. We might, <laughs> we might have a chance for one last question in that case. Who wants to go lucky last? All right, I think, but you're a, you're a part of the part of the organisers, are you? Uh, yes. Well, I think we might have to hand over to one of your guests. Oh, it's tonight. a very important question. It's a very important question. Is it acceptable for politicians to lie and deceive oh. to support their colleagues? No, sit down. That's ridiculous. <laughs> We want a question about, I mean, we want a question about pit water. Yes. Thanks, Jen from Ronaval. Um, it's a bit of an invisible issue, but it's our policing. Um, I don't know if everybody here knows that this is the first year in our police's history where we haven't had an intake into Goulburn. There is no intake whatsoever of new police officers in training. What I want to ask is, Jackie and Jeff, 
What, what would you do to reinvigorate our state police so that we have enough police officers and raise their morale and raise their profile right, in the that, community? Uh, with, with, with respect, that, uh, I, I would like the last question to go to Pittwater, if you don't mind. And um, you can ask that one. You can ask that one privately. Let's just go to this last question, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks. My name is Greg Pride, resident, 44 years. Uh, my question is to all candidates. Um, I'm with a small group who swims across Bongan Bay, Bongan Bongan Bay, Monavale each morning. This is a local environment question. We're currently putting together a submission, petition, and website to have Bongan Bongan Bay at the northern end of Monavale declared an aquatic reserve. My question is, what is the position of each candidate to that sort of proposal? Do they? Do you think all the candidates know about that proposal? Uh, Have you heard of I, it? I do. You do. Okay, go um, for it. Do you want to start, Jeff? Yep. Uh, I'm one of the dawn busters too, but uh, so it's you know it's pretty home for me that I'd really love to see it as a marine park. Uh, I caught my first fish in that bay in 1966. So when musk sticks were actually there, that right. increased we, in price. And what we used at to that, do, by that time, we, had, we used cord line and, and we had to make our own hooks. No. <laughs> yeah. But, oh Lord. But one of the most beautiful things you can do in this area is go for a swim at, at dawn through that bay. Yeah. We used to see, well, like back in 85 when I started, it had, there was heaps more fish and there was heaps more groper. Hey? Yeah, yeah but you, you caught can too many. You, I caught heaps, yeah. Yeah, it's your fault. But I'm one of the people and my family's one of the people that really caused, probably caused a lot of the fish to go. Come on, but Jeffrey. But that doesn't mean you don't change. You Come on, Jeffrey, move it. along. It's getting late. So that's a yes. 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 Um, so I, I met um, Greg the other day and he nearly drowned me. Rory nearly got a free kick because I, I swam the bay for the first time. Uh, look, in principle, I support um, like the Sydney Marine Park, a proposal that, um, that James Griffin failed to get up and over the line in 2018. And yet at first principles, yes, I support um, protecting our marine environments. On this particular proposal, as we've discussed, I. I'd need to see evidence. Obviously, I'd need to see community support. I'm a community-backed independent, continue to listen to the community and vote for the community every time. But in principle, yes, I support extension of um, protecting our marine environments. Okay. Yep. Um, yes, I'm a green. <laughs> say no more. Thank you. Thanks, um, Hilary and Jack and Jeff. Look, uh, conceptually, Greg, I, I agree with more protections and less protections. Um, I've actually made a representation to council officers about how would it work, what would it look like, what's their position, uh, given the expertise they have in that space. But conceptually, I support the idea of more than less protections. But like Jackie and, and like Jeff, I'd need to see the evidence um, as to what we would do to actually make it happen, how it would look, the effects it would have, and make sure the community actually supports well, it. Of course, the Liberal government over the, uh, the time it's been in power has wound back a lot of marine uh, reserves. And yes, it has. Is that, is that a question? No, no, that's just a statement. You okay. can... Well, I, I, I don't answer statements, but I can, I can respond if you want me to. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, look, I, no one's raised that with me on the streets. I'd need to go away and actually have some, get some advice, look into it, um, and, and come back to you. Okay. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I guess uh, we should take a vote on whether we sh think politicians should not lie. <laughs> I think we'd all be in that one. Um, but um, look, thank you very much for all coming this evening and, uh, and, and being so uh, lively and participating. Would you give a huge round of applause for all our candidates? Thank you. And uh, yes, I am a bit of a tough moderator, but I am the daughter of a headmaster, so... And you're just lucky that I saw a couple of... I was going to separate a couple of you up the back there, but I, 
but I stop short of that. So uh, we would also like to offer a vote of thanks for the wonderful organisers of this evening, of course, uh, the Northern Beaches uh, Climate Action Group and the Voices of Warringah. Huge <laughs> round of applause. So, uh, yes, there are refreshments, and if you'd like to make a donation, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, buy a drink or, or, or a snack or something like that. And uh, we thank you one and all for coming tonight. You want to say a few words, Nigel? <laughs> so, you know, you send out the program to everybody, and you tell them what's going to happen when, and you make a few mistakes, and everyone gets upset, and then you send the wrong time, and then you get a phone call in the middle of the night saying you've done it all wrong and all that sort of thing. We are the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. That means everything we do is a little bit hokey, um, but I hope it's fun as well. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. Firstly, let me tell you what we're not. We're not an incorporated organisation. We've got no board. We've got no money except for that that you put in the begging jar whenever you take our drinks off us or nick our food. Um, we're just a network of organizations, and how many of you know how many um, organizations are interested in climate action on the northern beaches? Is it more than 10? More than 20? More than 30? More than, more than 40? More than 50? It's actually 50 at the moment. It was 47 the other day, now it's 50. So now, how come we can organize a forum like this with all the political parties involved and the independents? Um, well, the reason is that we're uh, polypartisan. We're not non-partisan, we're polypartisan. So if I say something wrong, people get jumped down my throat and say, oh, you're being partisan. Well, I can say, no, it's okay, we're polypartisan. We want every voice heard. We want every uh, strand of political uh, interest represented. And um, when we put our invites out to the candidates, we said, please send us your favorite picture. Yeah. Yeah. So since we got no pictures back from some of our candidates, we just had to trawl the internet for our favourite one. <laughs> this was the best one we found for Rory. You should see the others. <laughs> the only people that are royalty to the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network are our youth. And I'm looking around here regretting the fact that there aren't any young people. No, there is. There's Ethan near there. Yay! Hi, Ethan. And so that's how we roll. Everything's ad hoc. We make it up as we go along. We make lots of mistakes. But we can draw on a huge talent of expertise from the 45 groups, from 800 people. <laughs> All right, second page. <laughs> so lastly, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank Catherine and Voices of Wringer. I want to thank, um, who was it, the guy who spoke for... Voices of Ringer, he did a great job. <laughs> Alex, that's it. Um, and uh, I want to thank Northern Beaches Council. So, Rory, thank you for the, to the Northern Beaches Council for giving us the cheapest rate for the room. <laughs> it's not, not as cheap as Buckety's, though. <laughs> I want to thank all the candidates, not only for nominating to represent us, because that already is a big thing, but also for coming here and facing the lion's den of our questions, unscripted and taking them as they come. And that's a very brave thing to do. So thank you for that. I want to thank you, all the audience, because you've made this a success. Um, I want to thank the crew, everyone in an I Love Northern Beaches t-shirt. Now, normally at this point, I say, if you see them standing by the bar, buy them a drink. Only we bought all the drinks this time. And we're looking forward to checking up the begging jar to see if we've got more money back or less money back than we paid. So we may be on a losser from that one. And Wayne, who does an amazing job uh, putting together the videos for these events, this will be posted onto our website 
tomorrow for people to view and it is actually the most important thing from these events because those videos get watched thousands of times where there's, there's, there's perhaps 200 people in the hall here. So that's the, the key way we're contrib contributing to democracy there. And uh, lastly, from all the media covering our event, <laughs> not that many. <laughs> and lastly, to our brilliant, absolutely brilliant presenter, although we won't be using her again because she's too rude for me. <laughs> Nigel originally, well, had sent me um, all the details for the event that I was hosting in Wakehurst, didn't you, Nigel? <laughs> that's, that's where, that, where, that's where that, that came from. Some people just can't take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks very much, Wendy. That's it, everybody. Uh, raid the last of the food, bung loads of money in the begging jar, and speak to our candidates with the questions you weren't able to ask. And lastly, just very lastly, while you're raiding the food, we need to thank Amber Waves, because they have donated all the food, um, all the uh, bread food for, for the event today. So thank you to them, and that's it. Thank you.